The old house sits, crooked and dilapidated, on the very end of the last street in town. It's the kind of house that children share stories about and warn each other to stay away from. There isn't even any graffiti on it, rare for an abandoned building in this town. But nobody is brave enough to get close to it and risk their life if the rumors of its history are to be believed. A black van containing four men pulls up along the curb outside the house. One of them has been black bagged, zip ties cutting into the skin of his wrists. He was leaving a bar in town when suddenly he found the barrel of a 9mm semi-automatic pistol looking him in the eye, held by a man with every reason to pull the trigger. Two other men had then emerged from the dark behind him. There was a brief feeling of cold metal against his skin as the twin metal barbs of the stun gun were jammed into the man's neck. His body then began to convulse as 50,000 volts of electricity ran through his body, and when he was finally able to open his eyes again, there was only darkness. The back doors of the van swing open, and the unfortunate man is pulled out by two of his captors. The driver joins to help drag the man down the gravel pathway up to the deserted house's front door. In his desperation, he offers any excuse he thinks might save him. Please, I just need a little more time. I can get the money, I swear. I've got another job lined up, honest. I start on Monday, just a little longer, I'm begging you. All he receives is silence as he's taken into the old house. There's no pleading, begging cliché that they haven't heard before. They've learned to just tune it out and get the job done. Click, click, click. The three men turn on their flashlights. The electricity hasn't been on in the uninhabited house for years. It's the domain of rats, roaches, and spiders now. The only evidence of life being the network of spider webs in every corner and the faint chittering sound of something coming from behind faded wallpaper. The only reason anyone would ever choose to come here is when you needed to do something under the absolute cover of dark, which is exactly what they needed to do. The dark-suited men drop their weeping prisoner to the ground. He tries again to plead with them and receives a hard kick in the gut. It knocks the breath out of the man, and he is left wheezing in quiet pain, no longer able to speak. One of them finally pulls the dark bag from his head. His nose is bleeding. His eyes are equal parts bleary and afraid, like he only half understands his circumstances. What he does understand, though, is that it's looking increasingly unlikely that he'll be leaving this house tonight. The three men look down at the pathetic figure huddled on the floorboards. None of them really want to be here, but this is the job they've been paid to do. They are unaware, though, that they aren't the only ones watching. Somewhere in the dark is someone else who watches them with a detached, almost amused curiosity. Taking in the deep dark of the house, one of the men wonders aloud whether it might be haunted. The man with the gun laughs as he pulls back the hammer on his gun and tells him that there's about to be one more ghost here. But just as he is about to pull the trigger and put an end to their captor's terrified blubbering, he suddenly hears something that gives him pause, something from above them, upstairs. Is he imagining it? Or are those particles of dust floating down from the ceiling, accompanied by the sound of footsteps? All of the men clearly hear it, and the three look around, shining their flashlights into the dark corners of the room. The one holding the man at gunpoint motions to one of the others to go check upstairs. He looks like he'd rather do anything else, but when the man with the gun, who is clearly the one in charge, turns and points his gun at him instead, the man finally concedes that he'll go check it out. He draws a gun of his own from inside his pocket and starts making his way up the creaking stairs to the second floor of the house. The leader's mind is still on whatever's upstairs. His dumb lackey tried filling his head with all those goofy ghost stories, but he knows, deep down, it's probably just a raccoon or something. When his driver has ensured there are no other witnesses, he'll finish the job and they can all get out of this creepy dump. He calls up to the driver and asks him if he sees anything up there. Nothing, he calls down. I think we're... His words are cut off by his own sudden scream. There are two gunshots, followed by a loud thump as something heavy hits the ground. The two men, both with guns out, crouch down in defensive poses. They call out again, asking what's happening, but they're only met with cold, unforgiving silence. Everyone is on high alert now. Even the bound man is now more afraid of whatever's upstairs than the men who brought him here. Nobody dares move as, after what feels like minutes of silence, the footsteps resume upstairs again. The leader calls out again, asking what's going on. Still no reply, just more footsteps. They follow the sound across the floor above them to the stairs, then listen as the steps start to creak again. Their eyes drift over where they see… nothing. Are they going insane? The two hired guns share a panicked glance, as if to say, what do we do now? But neither has an answer. 
A quiet, reedy whisper suddenly echoes through the stale air of the house. With what sounds like a female voice, it rasps, What are you doing in my house? The remaining lackey, consumed by panic, begins firing wildly into the dark. The captive and the leader both get as close as they can to the floor as bullets fly through the air, piercing the old wooden walls causing roaches alike to scatter. Soon enough, the bullets are gone, replaced with only the feeble click-click-click of his dry firing. What is going on in here? He thinks. This place really is haunted. Before another fearful thought can cross his mind, a lamp comes flying at him out of the darkness, shattering into pieces of skin-carving ceramic against his face. Next comes a book, then an old heavy phone, and then a dusty old brick that strikes his skull with a monstrous crunch. He drops to his knees, bleeding from both nostrils and the deep gash cut into his forehead, before flopping face down onto the floor. He'll be lucky if he ever wakes up. Only the leader and his prisoner are left now, both confused, both afraid, both seemingly beset by a poltergeist. Suddenly, the leader feels a hot breath on his neck and a whisper right into his ear. You shouldn't have come here, it hisses. He turns, screams, and fires once into the dark. Nothing. A strange, tinny giggle suddenly loops around him. It's everywhere and nowhere. He can hear footsteps, but where are they coming from? They're simultaneously getting further and getting closer. An unseen fist collides with his jaw, harder than he's been hit in a long time. He stumbles, looking around for the assailant, panting like a prize fighter in the championship rounds. But there's nothing there. There's nothing. Crack! It strikes the other side of his face, another giggle from the dark. He spits a tooth out as his mouth bleeds. Not knowing what else to do, he extends his arm and fires desperately. Maybe he'll get lucky, or maybe not. A force wraps itself around his extended arm and pulls on it with a sudden, immense pressure. It snaps before he has the chance to scream, his arm bending at the joint in the wrong direction. He lets out an agonized cry as he drops his gun to the ground, but that scream is cut off when he takes a punch to the solar plexus, sapping the wind from him as he spews out a thin mist of blood that settles onto the shape of a woman's face staring right at him, grinning. His terror and pain overcome him. His mind snaps and he faints from panic collapsing to the ground in a heap. His jacket opens as invisible fingers work a handkerchief from an inside pocket and wipe the blood from the floating face, leaving only a floating, bloody handkerchief. The man on the ground, the one who was brought here against his will, watches astonished and speechless as the handkerchief flutters down to the ground. All he can do is stare in amazement as the leader's arm flops limply upright, as the gold watch around his wrist unclasps itself and floats into the air and then, with a strange gulping noise, disappears entirely. Footsteps creak across the ground. The front door opens, then closes again, leaving the terrified man in silence, lying on the floor between two bodies. After a time, he finally gains the courage to stand up. He creeps nervously towards the front door and opens it. There's no one outside. Not that he could see whatever assailant just took out the group of men anyway. With one last look back into the dark house, he steps out and closes the door behind him, He's free, and no matter how hard he tries, he will never understand the true nature of the invisible specter that just saved his life. But while none of the men will never know what they encountered that night, the SCP Foundation certainly does, because these are the kind of antics you can expect from SCP-347, also known by the somewhat obvious nickname of the Invisible Woman. But she has another name, her own self-chosen epithet, Claudia. Foundation staff are currently unsure whether this is the real name of the SCP-347 entity or a pseudonymized reference to Claude Rains, the English actor who portrayed Dr. Jack Griffin in the 1933 film The Invisible Man. Of course, nothing is really as it seems when it comes to this particular anomaly, though it's easy to be more than what meets the eye when nothing meets the eye at all. Claudia, as I will refer to her both out of respect for her chosen name as well as for the sake of simplicity, is 164 centimeters in height and 55 kilograms in weight. And that's really all that is known for sure about her, because her primary anomalous trait is, of course, that she is completely and utterly invisible. Although she seems to possess them like an average human, all parts of her body, including blood and hair, will remain invisible even if removed from her body. It seems that only saliva and bodily waste become visible when separated from her body, as a number of disgruntled, mop-and-bucket-wielding D-classes are more than aware. Claudia is able to see through what also must be anomalous means, since in typical humans, the cones and rods of the eyes must be visible for them to receive light and thus see. 
Research is ongoing as to how exactly this is possible, as well as what it could potentially provide for active camouflage technology. By her own description, which due to her skittish and crafty personality must be taken with a grain of salt, Claudia is a mixed-race woman between the ages of 19 and 25, with brown eyes and wavy black hair. She appears to have no anomalous traits other than her invisibility, no super strength or speed, no ability to fly. However, what she does have is a very particular set of skills. Skills that make her a nightmare to anyone wishing to keep her under lock and key. Like, for example, the SCP Foundation. The Foundation quickly learned that Claudia is an accomplished escape and infiltration artist with the lockpicking skills of a veteran thief. She's able to move while making very little noise, which complements her natural stealth advantages perfectly, allowing her to get in and out of secured areas easily. These are skills she's developed not only to survive, but to support certain psychological dependencies she suffers from. While Foundation psychologists have posited a number of mental conditions that could be affecting Claudia, two seem to have risen to prominence, kleptomania and pica. Claudia appears to be compulsively driven to steal as a kind of psychological crutch. Being invisible, naturally, makes her an impeccable thief. However, when she has obtained the item of her desire, said item floating through the air is likely to draw unwanted attention. That is where her second strange habit comes in. Pica is an eating disorder that causes sufferers to consume items that are not food, sometimes damaging themselves in the process. Claudia has developed the unhealthy habit of swallowing some of the smaller items she steals, causing them to seemingly disappear until she later vomits the items back up. When interviewed on the matter, Claudia stated that she'd gotten the idea from watching Stevie Starr perform on a late-night television show. Starr is a Scottish performer known for his ability to swallow and regurgitate mm. items, though Starr's ability doesn't extend far enough to meet the Foundation's threshold for anomalous. Before she was brought into containment, Claudia had a preference for abandoned houses. The home where Foundation agents finally discovered her was one with a long history of reported poltergeist activity. As is standard in instances where spectral phenomena were suspected, the Foundation moved in with infrared cameras, allowing them to quickly detect the humanoid shape of Claudia and move in to intercept her. Without the advantage of her invisibility, she had no chance of either evading or besting trained Foundation operatives in combat. Thankfully, it didn't need to come to that, and after a brief period of deliberation, Claudia gave herself up to the Foundation willingly in exchange for shelter and warm meals, both of which would be provided for her in containment. Prior to this, it's believed that she was effectively homeless for years and had been making ends meet in any way she could. She refuses to discuss her past directly, though a long string of ghost activity across the area and at least two deaths have been solidly linked to her activities. Being unseen for years of her life has taken an undeniable mental toll on Claudia, the isolation leading to instability and even violent outbursts on occasion. Thankfully, she has responded well to treatment from Foundation counselors and psychiatrists, which has reduced the frequency of these violent outbursts significantly. As she recovers further from her traumatic past, there is hope that Claudia may even begin to recover from her kleptomaniac tendencies altogether, allowing her to live a normal, well-adjusted life, or as much as one can hope to live while still remaining invisible. There's even more good news, though. Since entering containment and undergoing recovery, Claudia has become much more social. She enjoys interacting with other people, especially when they treat her as though she's an average person, and some of her actions have even been described as bordering on flirtatious. She enjoys interacting physically with people, and often plays impish pranks on the unsuspecting people sent into her chamber, such as rearranging or taking items to confuse them. She also shows, for unknown reasons, a particular fondness for interacting with people as they sleep, often touching and stroking them, though it may have been one of the only ways she was able to have human contact prior to entering Foundation custody. While she describes this as feeling right, those who experience it from the other side describe it as feeling unnerving, as though they've been touched by a ghost. Naturally, due to being an intelligent escape artist that is impossible to see through conventional means, Foundation containment specialists have needed to go all out on her containment measures, both to keep her contained and to keep her comfortable enough that she has no desire to attempt a containment breach. She is kept in a 5 meter by 5 meter room in Site 17, constantly monitored by a remote infrared camera, and in addition to infrared detection systems, Claudia is also visible in ultraviolet light, expanding the Foundation's means of seeing her. Her room has an ensuite bathroom with a shower and bathtub, and is furnished with a queen-sized bed, several oversized beanbag chairs, two armchairs, a desk and swivel chair, 
several bookcases, and a TV with a DVD player. The bookcases are filled with various books, primarily adventure novels, harlequin romances, and art books. She's allowed DVDs of various movies and TV shows predating her arrival at the SCP facility, and may request new material to be reviewed every so often. Claudia is given access to any clothes she pleases, though she often prefers to remain unclothed to take advantage of her full invisibility. She does, on occasion, wear wigs and makeup for her own amusement. Her room must remain locked at all times when she is inside it, and two guards are required to check the door for any signs of tampering every hour. The door is only unlocked to allow staff members in and out of the containment chamber for the purposes of research and enrichment. Claudia enjoys chatting with staff members who bring her food, though said staff members are discouraged from forming attachments that are too close to Claudia, as it may allow her to manipulate them into helping her escape or gain special privileges. On the rare occasions when Claudia is allowed to leave the room, she is mandated to wear gloves and a layer of grease paint over her face to give personnel awareness of her hands and facial expressions. If she does attempt violent action or escape, she must be apprehended immediately and placed back into her room. In the event of an escape, infrared goggles will be distributed to all personnel, and any strange phenomena around Site-17 will be reported. Thankfully, escape attempts are quite infrequent, and while she currently has the Euclid Object class, pending further therapy, her containment class may be upgraded to Safe class. Of course, the Foundation keeps any containment breaches close to the chest, and if there was a recent containment breach, you'd have no way of knowing. For all you know, she could be watching you right now. So sleep tight, and if you feel someone stroking your hair in the night, be sure to check up on your valuables in the morning. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-181, Lucky, for another humanoid anomaly with unique powers. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.